So she's a, she's a myth as well. Okay. Um, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started now. So I'm Craig Cohen. I'm one of the PIs of GlowPal uh, Health Fellowship. And we also have uh, Pat Conrad, who's the, the other, one of the other PIs from uh, Represent UC Davis. And then we have Kimberly Bale, who's the program manager uh, for GlowCal. And then we have uh, our people who help support the UC Global Health Institute here, uh, Melody and Vanessa. Um, and I think on the, on the call, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give a brief, relatively brief presentation. And then uh, Lauren Hack, who's one of our, who's faculty now at UCSF, and also one of our alumni is gonna also give a presentation. Uh, and then there'll be a chance for individual for those who are joining the call to um, ask questions, and we'll do our best to respond to those questions. Okay. Uh, and then Pat's only on. Unfortunately, Pat can only be on for the first half an hour. Uh, so if there are any pertinent questions um, to be directed at her, we'll need to do that before uh, before nine or ten thirty. Sorry. But Craig, okay. I also I'm happy to follow up, um, and uh, and anybody can and email me or arrange to talk if I can be of help. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Thanks. Uh, okay. um, so we're now in our uh, seventh year of the UCGHI uh, uh, GlowCal Health Fellowship, and we are essentially focused on supporting aspiring global health researchers uh, to move ahead with inter and transdisciplinary research um, at one of our sites around the world. Um, and I'll talk more about the specifics of the program. <clears throat> so this is funded by the NIH, by the Fogarty International Center, and uh, also funded through the UC Global Health Institute since 2012. Uh, so we're now in our seventh year. We're recruiting for our eighth um, a class, if you will, of fellows. Um, this is, GlowCal is one of the six programs that's funded by the Fogarty International Center. Um, there are other consortia around the U.S. with their partners and LMICs. The six programs work very closely and collaborate with one another to support the program overall um, and provide some unique opportunities for fellows, um, both in regards to training and support on site and developing uh, network networks that can support fellows in their career. Uh, so far, we've had 94 fellows that have been funded in the first uh, seven cohorts. These are the leaders. So you have two of us on the phone, <clears throat> uh, myself and Pat Conrad. Uh, Stephanie Strathy is the other uh, PI who's at UC San Diego and Jeff Klausner is at UCLA. We also have tremendous support from uh, leaders from our LMIC uh, institutions as well. So we have four components to the program. The first is the, uh, the, the centerpiece, of course, is the research, the mentored research, which is conducted over a 12 month period of time. Uh, this is uh, a requirement is that at least 11 of those 12 months were spent in the uh, in on site in the low and middle income country, uh, working with the partner institution there. Um, there's obviously a strong mentorship component, uh, which we require mentors from uh, uh, essentially three mentors to be designated. Uh, one, usually, if you're a UC applicant, that would be from your UC campus in your discipline. Uh, another, it could be, and then somebody else in another discipline, it could be from another UC campus or it could be from your, your UC campus. And then you need to have a mentor designated from the LMIC partner institution. Um, and then another component is we provide some support for global health education. Mainly it's online education. Pat Conrad uh, uh, runs that pillar. And then we have a career development arm, which we actually just had a call uh, the other day these are on a monthly basis where there's an opportunity to have presentations from leaders in global health, from both uh, academic as well as uh, other sectors uh, linked to global health, uh, uh, NGOs and government uh, entities, um, and both from the U.S. and also from our uh, low and middle income country partners. <clears throat> so these are the countries where we currently operate. We work in 17 uh, low and middle income countries, we work with 20 institutions uh, in those countries. So uh, countries like uh, Uganda, for example, have two partners uh, in country. <clears throat> um, 
And you can see we're primarily weighted in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we have two sites in Latin America, Guatemala and Peru, and then two site, three sites in Asia, Bangladesh, India, and Vietnam. And here's a list of the countries uh, where we partner. Um, so in regards to program eligibility, uh, it is open to all US postdoctoral fellows. Um, and uh, also foreign postdoctoral fellows from, from the participating countries. Uh, in general, we try to have a, a balanced cohort of, of fellows in the program, about half from our LMIC countries and half from the US or connected with the University of California. We also offer positions to the senior professional students. These are people who are working on their MDs, usually between their third and fourth years. Uh, uh, dental degree, uh, veterinary medicine degree, PharmD, et cetera, uh, and also advanced doctoral students, usually those who are working on their dissertation project. This could actually, GlowCal could help fund a dissertation project. And again, if they're a student, professional or advanced doctoral student, they have to be from one of the 10 uh, UC campuses. So for LMIC fellows, they have to be postdocs uh, in order to be eligible for uh, to apply for the program. So we are very interdisciplinary. We have had fellows work in the various health sectors primarily, but also we, we appreciate those who also extend outside of the health area or even have their primary discipline be outside of health, including genetics, uh, social sciences, engineering, mathematics, anthropology, and agriculture, environmental sciences. And this is not an exclusive list. This is just a partial list of uh, another example. So we had a pharmacist who was uh, interested in, in developing or identifying new um, uh, therapeutics to treat cancer and was work, working with the Scripps Institute at UC San Diego and, and with colleagues at the University of Panama and was literally working in oceanography and pharmacy to comb the oceans for cyanobacteria species and then look for unique uh, drug targets to treat cancer. So those are some of the types of fellows and projects that we funded in the past. And you can look online on our website to see the list of fellows that we currently have and also at all the earlier years and some of the, what their projects have been about. The selection process, so uh, the application is submitted, the written application, um, which includes a concept for uh, research and a personal statement, uh, letters of recommendation, uh, from the uh, mentors, uh, including the LMIC site. Um, and then that gets reviewed by a steering committee. The steering committee is comprised of members connected with campuses across the UC system, um, as well as from our LMIC partner institutions. And people serve on the steering committee on a rotational basis for two or three years. We then have a leadership group comprised of the four PIs and three members of our L three uh, senior people from uh, our LMIC partner institutions. And together, we're the ones who then review the steering committee recommendations and scores, uh, and then offer a, um, uh, an interview to the usually the top half of applicants, who then are uh, requested to have an interview. And it's a panel interview that's comprised of the steering committee and leadership group members. And then after that, the leadership group will meet <clears throat> and decide who to offer acceptance to, who to put on a wait list, and uh, who to accept. Sorry, and who to reject. <clears throat> hey, this person looks familiar, and Lauren will be speaking later. Uh, we do have, uh, I'm going with the pets for. So um, we do have funding from, from the Folk Media National Center realizing that the money that comes from NIH, some of it is targeted to certain health topics. So for example, um, about half of our money is targeted for HIV research. Uh, so that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, some of us are doing research that we wouldn't consider HIV, but, by we, but we're working in areas where HIV is endemic, and so we can add an aim, and now we can be considered for the HIV monies. Uh, and that may be important, and in this coming up here, in fact, uh, we were given uh, extra resources from Fogarty, $250,000 for HIV research, end of year money. So we're going to be able to offer probably more than half of the positions will go to people working in HIV research. So when you're working with your mentors or if you have any questions for us, 
you may want to consider having your research, if you were previously not thinking of HIV-related research, of adding an aim to be a comparison of HIV-positive children and negative children as an example, um, and we can work with you to thank you for that. In addition, we have other money from the National Institute of Mental Health, which specifically is to fund fellows to work in non-HIV mental health related uh, uh, projects. So, and then, um, so you shouldn't think about this as a limitation per se, but it more or less as an opportunity as you're trying to target your research concept to the needs, the funding needs and, and uh, uh, priorities of the funding entity, which isn't so much GLOCAL as it is the NIH. Um, so this is, these are just some examples of fellows in the field. So Natalie uh, Ferraiello, I'm sure I didn't pronounce her name right. She's a medical student from UC San Diego uh, who's looking at depression among deportees undergoing gang tattoo removal in Tijuana. Um, and she's currently a family medicine resident uh, at Scripps Mercy uh, Hospital. Kendra Bird uh, was a doctoral student at UC Davis, and she was looking at uh, the iron status in infants in Kenya, um, and she's currently a nutrition scientist uh, for Worldfish in Malaysia, so she's working in the NGO sector. Uh, Javier Cepeda is, was a U.S. postdoc, is now faculty at UC San Diego. Uh, he was looking at cost analysis of police education programs in Tijuana and Mexico, but he's also expanded his work to, uh, to Russia, working in St. Petersburg, um, with tuberculosis. Um, so he's a person who, and Lauren's another person who's successfully used GLOCAL to help transition their positions from a postdoctoral position into a faculty position at the University of California. I think Chang is another example. Uh, she's a, <clears throat> she was a U.S. postdoc at UCSF uh, looking at improving the diagnosis of uh, Kaposi sarcoma working in Uganda and also in Kenya. She's now an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Dermatology at UCSF, continuing to expand her, her work in that area. Uh, Jennifer Sivertson uh, was a U.S. postdoc at UC San Diego, looking at emergent, and she had previously been working in Mexico, but then connected with myself and others working in Kenya. Uh, and she took on the, the task of studying emergent injection drug use and HIV risk in Kenya. So she's someone who's successfully bridged two campuses to be able to create her research experience. And now she's faculty at UC Riverside, so a third campus. And uh, she's also looking for, um, and she's an anthropology uh, assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at UC Riverside. So GLOCAL provide, and UCJHI broad, more broadly speaking, provides an opportunity for you, for individuals who are applying to this program to, to work when it makes sense with people across the UC system. So you're not limited to individuals and their expertise and their backgrounds and the sites they work in to the campus that you're affiliated with, but you can actually work much more broadly across the system. And myself and Pat uh, and Kimberly can help you make some of those connections as, uh, as needed if you're not able to do those on your own. Kalika Konda uh, was a junior faculty member at UCLA. She's still on back at UCLA and lives uh, at, uh, in Lima, Peru, um, and her study was looking at adapting couples' voluntary counseling for uh, gay men, um, and she continues that work. And she's also served as a mentor, and she is serving as a mentor for um, the current cohort of GLOCAL fellows. So she is an example of someone who's transitioned from being a fellow faculty and then now supporting the next generation um, of, of fellows. Uh, mentorship is a cornerstone of, uh, of this program, and it's really you know, a requirement that you have, you're working to develop those relationships. Some of you have those relationships on your various campuses or your institutions, but are looking for opportunities to be able to expand your mentorship network. Um, so each fellow, as I mentioned earlier, has at least three. We look at a team mentorship approach um, so that you can gain from people with a variety of disciplinary backgrounds or educational backgrounds or professional backgrounds and personal perspectives as well as part of mentorship. It's not just a professional endeavor, but it's also one that potentially has an ability to support you as you develop uh, through your career uh, with uh, the kind of the work-life balance issues as, as those arise. Um, so we, as I mentioned, the requirement is that 
you can come from, you can be connected with any UC campus, but because of the nature of the funding, um, you have to have a mentor from one of the four primary UC campuses. So Davis, LA, San Diego, and UCSF. But if you're at UC Santa Cruz, your primary mentor can be at UC Santa Cruz, for example. Uh, but you would, we would ask that you have a co-mentor from one of the other, one of those four campuses. And then a mentor from the international site. Um, and this trans mentor concept is someone who maybe doesn't have the disciplinary expertise to support you in the research per se, but can ask, act more as a professional mentor for you. Um, I'm going to skip this, but we you know, have expectations for the mentors that we want to make sure that people are dedicated to the process, have dedicated time uh, to support you um, uh, throughout this year, and also in preparation for the program and then afterwards. It's much longer than a one-year relationship. Um, in regards to successful applications, uh, we usually, I mean, we'll see what we get this year. We don't know until the deadline. We usually get about uh, 40 applications and we accept anywhere from 12 to 15. Uh, again, a balance between uh, fellows, uh, US fellows and LMIC fellows. Um, and so this year we've made some enhancements to the application process. We saw that some people were turning in amazing applications uh, and others struggled. Um, and so we now put on the website, uh, which you can, it's on, it's on the GlowCal website, we put examples of successful applications from a variety of disciplines. Um, and this is something also, it's really important that you start working on your applications as early as possible and get feedback from your mentors to help you improve the quality of your application. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we collaborate. The six consortia funded by the Fogarty are collaborating uh, on a regular basis. We have an NI, we have an orientation for the fellowship. Uh, usually, it's the, in the first half of July. Um, it's one of my favorite weeks of the year, bringing together the fellow, the GlowCal fellows, with the fellows from the other five consortia. It's an opportunity to meet to network. It's an opportunity to meet with many directors from the NIH, including. This last year, most years, Francis Collins, the overall director of the NIH, uh, meets with people. Um, it's an opportunity to meet with program officers or people that are that are going to be potentially, if we're going to be NIH funded, these are people that want to support, encourage your success, support you, and want to, and hopefully you can develop relationships so they're going to continue to fund you and your work. Um, we also have regional mentorship development workshops um, on you know, within the various regions. We're working on publications together. Uh, we're just finishing up a, a publication, a special issue, American Journal of Tropical Medicine, on mentoring and LMICs. Um, and then we share resources, educational and otherwise, uh, between the conservatory. So essentially, providing many more resources than we can provide. Any one program can find our own. We each have our strengths and our, and our weaker areas. Um, the applications are due November 15th. I think all of you have that on your calendars. And then any particular questions around the application process can be sent to Kimberly. And then Kimberly is great at being able to send questions that she may not be able to answer on her own, or she thinks your questions would be best answered by myself, Pat, uh, Stephanie Strathy, or Jeff Klausner. Um, and she sends those queries out to us. And then the four of us also work collaboratively. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with a, a, a potential applicant from UC Davis, for example. That's it. No, I'm what? No. I stopped. Sorry, my turn to go? Is that right? Okay, so let me just pull this up here and share my screen. Sorry, I'm not the most savvy with this. Okay, so one more second and I should have it here. Okay, can you all see that? Thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Great. 
Um, so I'm going to talk today um, about my experience two years ago as a Fogarty Fellow um, with my project in Sinaloa, Mexico, um, which was called the School Home Program for Mexican Children with Attention and Behavioral Concerns. Okay. Um, how do I? Okay, so my project was really focused on investigating unmet need and building capacity in school mental health. And so the top left picture, um, you can see I'm there with my colleague. Put it in slideshow mode. Okay, let me do that. Thanks, Vanessa. Okay. Um, these are my colleagues on the top left here. Ava Araujo is on the right. She is a research psychologist um, at the University of Sinaloa. And she was um, really my, a, an instrumental colleague in my fellowship. She had come up to uh, UC San Francisco for her fellowship um, the year before and we had worked on a school home program for the schools in San Francisco designing a Spanish language version and so when I was considering my um, bridge time between um, postdoctoral fellowship and assistant professorship I thought it would be really neat to go down to Mexico and pilot test the intervention in their setting since uh, it went so well uh, working with Ava with the Spanish speaking families in, in San Francisco. And so they were really warm and open to having me there. And then um, Ava helped me find a mentor at the University of Sinaloa, as well as a mentor at one of the approved GlobeCal sites. And then on the left is our research assistant, Corelli, um, who also was really instrumental during the project. Um, so these are all pictures actually from the site. So the top pictures are us um, doing a study investigating the unmet needs. So we went into the um, schools in Sinaloa and conducted a study where we showed a silent video of a little child displaying ADHD-like behaviors and then asked parents and teachers to answer questions about what they saw and what they thought that was, uh, what they would call that, how they would seek help for that. Um, and then we actually trained school mental health professionals to deliver a behavioral treatment for ADHD. And so that's what the um, pet was for in my picture. So we do a lot of uh, modeling with puppets and role plays and activities. Um, and then there's a lot of really classic psychology concepts that we teach, like contingency management through the use of that um, green, yellow, red behavior chart. Um, and so it's, uh, it was a really neat experience to work directly with the frontline providers in Mexico, give them these skills that could um, be maintained even after my, you know, one year fellowship was up. And so you can see on the bottom right, that's our training with some of the school mental health professionals. Okay. Um, so these are kind of my main points that I wanted to talk about in terms of what I got out of the project and what I think would be helpful for students looking for mentors to, to potentially know they can get out of this opportunity. So I really found huge value in forming these collaborations with colleagues and mentors and organizations in Mexico. Um, and it really starts immediately with the GloCal orientation. Um, I didn't really understand how important that was going to be as part of a fellowship, but it really was really huge for me to meet other young uh, trainees or early stage investigators who are interested in global health across the country and across the world. Um, and I've maintained a lot of those relationships with people I've met just during that first one week orientation. And then obviously as well as all of the people that I worked with during my fellowship. Um, but really, I think the magic comes from continuing those relationships after the one year fellowship. So I have written um, a UCSF RAP grant and two R21s with um, my colleagues that I had in Mexico. Um, I also um, 
a team, actually Craig uh, introduced me to Jennifer, who you saw um, in one of the past slides, and two other senior global health researchers at UC San Diego, and we proposed a course to the Innovation Learning Technology Center through UC, and that got funded. So we're going to be working on an online global mental health course. So that it was really neat to kind of have some of my first steps as an assistant professor be um, facilitated by groundwork laid in my fellowship. And then for a lot of people, this might be their first time getting first-hand experience really seeing a project from start to finish. So everything from the IRB approval, which can be really complex, um, to recruitment and troubleshooting issues with that, to actually implementing whatever the project is and doing the troubleshooting right there on the spot in the moment. And then of course the analyses and interpretation and dissemination and publication. Um, so I think for mentors, really helping the, the trainee do this with um, guidance is key because when they're an assistant professor, they're gonna be expected to do it by themselves and they may never have done it before. So kind of helping them think through those steps and um, not giving them the answer right as they ask for it, but helping them really think through the answer and then if they're stuck or they need help providing that guidance is, is a, um, a crucial step, I think, in the learning trajectory of an emerging researcher. And then of course, just getting exposure to new settings and systems and cultures. So it was huge for me, since I'm writing grants to propose mental health interventions in the Sinaloa public school system, I really needed to be there. I needed to see what the schools look like, you know, what time of day do they start? What are their holidays? What is the actual physical environment like? Things that you can't get unless you actually immerse yourself in that culture. Um, and then also just immersing yourself in a new culture and understanding what it feels like to be, um, you know, an expat in a situation where you're not surrounded by people who share the same customs and language, I think is key for personal and professional development. Um, so these are, I just pulled out some pictures of some of my highlights. I thought um, another thing that I didn't really realize was going to be a huge outcome of this was building a lab and training the next generation. So on the bottom left and um, top right, you can see Corelli. That was our research assistant. And this is her proposing her thesis. Um, and this was actually this year. So this was after I came. But they, you know, we've kept in contact and her thesis has been from the work that we did. And then you can see this is a huge lab of undergraduate students that we exposed to mental health research that um, wouldn't have been exposed to that level of research without this project. And then um, really part of the GLOCAL experience should be personal development and building relationships um, with people who are different than the people that you know, the trainees may be used to, and also just seeing a new culture and traveling and, and getting a sense of the context that they're in, I think is really important. Um, and then sharing information I found was really um, key to my learning as well as get, keeping steam going from the project into future ideas. And we really did this at a multi-level approach. So we had local conferences on the top left that's us presenting just for the Sinaloa School District and those stakeholders. And then the top right, that was a local um, Sinaloa special education conference workshop that we were at. Um, the bottom right was kind of like APA, American Psychological Association, but Mexico's version. And then the bottom middle, that was a more local conference that we did. And then the bottom left was an, an international conference. So we really tried to disseminate our results um, locally and internationally. And then we also wanted to make sure we didn't just do scientific conferences, but we also shared our information with stakeholders. So here you can see we did celebrations for schools that were trained in this program so that they could really feel like they have that capacity now to continue doing the program. Um, and then this is us with uh, doing that conference at the public school district. And after doing this our first year, they said that they wanted this program in every single school. And so that's really what helped us write the R21 to expand this program. Program. And then lastly, we got a lot of press and media, which was cool because that was a way that we could actually share the results immediately with the families and with the communities before, you know, the publications are out in press and things like that. Um, so I thought that was another really um, important aspect of what we did. And really, the mentors were key in this because they're the ones that are kind of well known and have the outlets to the media and things like that. 
Um, so that is what I have prepared, but I'd be happy to take any questions or just hang out to see if people have questions at the end. And that was amazing. And uh, I always gain more insight every time we have a chance to, I get to hear your story. Um, maybe we can start with questions for Lauren. So people are going to need to unmute themselves and if they're going to ask a question. Justice, are you trying to ask a question? Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much for I can see how uh, your study is reaching. And uh, uh, I'm from Uganda, and uh, actually mental health in So Justice, maybe um, we're not able to hear you. Maybe do, if you can go into the um, chat section, you could write a question. Maybe that's going to be easier to respond to. You can, yeah, you can do a chat and send a question. That's for anybody as well. Um, any other, does anybody else have a question, either for Lauren or for myself? Chat. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Any other questions right now? Do people have questions about the program, application process, um, eligibility? Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Monica from UCSD. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, great. Um, so I, so my my mentor here at UCSD, he's not uh, part of the GlowCal consortium, but I was wondering if um, it's a requirement for the mentor to be part of the uh, like a, a under the GlowCal mentor list, or um, can he join <laughs> as a new mentor? What and what's the the process for for doing that? Yeah, great question. So, um, yeah, so we have, you know, when we submitted the grant, we had to submit a list of mentors that had agreed to serve as mentors, or individuals who served as mentors, both University of California faculty as well as faculty connected with one of the 20 LMIC institutions. Uh, that being said, uh, a ment anyone who's faculty at the University of California, any 10 campuses, is eligible to be a mentor for GlowCal, even if they're not already listed. So you're not limited by that list. And the same thing, similarly, if it's a faculty member from the LMIC partner institution and they're not on the list, they also are eligible as well. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so, the, so a lot of flexibility um, in that regard. Yeah. Um, I see another question from Florence. Um, I joined, or no, sorry, Mbuthe. So, can you share the eligibility? So, Mbuthe, I, oh, you're from Mozambique. So, the eligibility is you have to be considered by the NIH as a postdoc, uh, meaning you have a PhD, an MBCHB, uh, a PharmD, 
uh, a DVM, a veterinary disease uh, degree, or a, essentially a doctoral, a doctorate, or a doctoral equivalent in order to be eligible. There's also a question from Lawrence, which is, can you explain what affiliation to UCSF means? Is it via a mentor, or must you be enrolled in a program in Yeah, so you just need, it's through a mentor. You don't need to be enrolled at UCSF in order to be eligible. So I'm not, Florence, I'm gonna guess from your, well, I don't know where you're from. Do you wanna maybe tell us where you're from? Um, I can guess, but you could be, you either could be from the US, you could be from Kenya or Tanzania. Those are my guesses. Maybe Uganda, probably not. Probably most likely Kenya. Um, so Uganda, okay. Sorry, um, <laughs> I knew it was one of the three. So, um, what's the question? Is it a mentor? So you don't need to be enrolled in the program. Essentially, you would want to work, and it doesn't have to be UCSF. It can be, you could have a UC mentor from any of the 10 campuses. Although, because you're in Uganda, you probably work with people connected with UCSF, I'm gonna guess. Um, but it could be from UCSF and or any of the other campuses. And that's enough. And then you have to be connected through uh, either the Infectious Disease Institute or IDRC, the NGO partner. Uh, with, those are our two partners uh, in Uganda. So you'd have to work with mentors within one or both of those institutions. Both of those institutions are are connected with um, with Macquarie University. Uh, no. So the that it has to be it would have to be awarded. So a good question about the PhD. Um, you would want the PhD. We'd have to have assurance that it would be awarded by uh, June of 2019. So just prior to when this program would start. That's all. How similar or different? Should you should read it out because people. Okay. okay. So the question is. Thank you very much. For this presentation, how similar or different should the proposed projects be from our previous research? Do you recommend building on previous work and working with existing international networks or proposing something entirely new with a new international partner? Um, that's a great question. And I look at fellowship as a way, a pathway by to go from where you're at. And I'm not sure if you are a postdoc or a doctoral professional student. And this is from Anne. Um, but to, how do you get from where you're at to where you want to go, wherever it is you want to go? So um, if that, if what makes the most sense is to build on your current work, um, which for many people it does, that's great. If it's not, you see it as an opportunity to expand your work. Maybe your work's been entirely in the U.S. and now you want to work more internationally. So an example would be Jennifer Syverston who's working in the US and in Mexico, but then wanted to work in Kenya. So she used the fellowship as an opportunity to build new relationships and she continues to work in Kenya uh, with various uh, partner organizations there. So it really depends on what you need and what you're passionate about and, and more specifically, where it is you're trying to go. I know, Lauren, do you want to answer that maybe as well? Because you, I think you might be a good person to answer that. Sure. So can so you're wondering more about the proposal? Yeah, it's a proposal. So so Anne is asking, should she continue to build on the work she's already doing, or would it make sense to build new relationships and to move into a new research area? Um, I feel like it would be really hard to completely move into a new research area. I feel like there's a lot of challenges already with doing work that you're already familiar with in a new setting, which is kind of what I did. Um, and so I think it would be extra challenging to then also be in a new area. But I think it depends on your level of training. So if you're like a med student and you don't have that much experience, you know, it probably does make sense to branch out more. Um, but if you're more of a postdoc looking to transition to an assistant professorship, I think it might serve people well to stay in an area that they've already done so that it's really, you know, lining up uh, next steps for career. So maybe, maybe I'll add also that like Jennifer Syverson, I keep on coming back to her, but she was working in IV drug users and HIV in Mexico and then took that expertise to work in that similar topic um, in Kenya. So she changed sites 
but kept within her area of expertise um, as an example. And she and was successful. I see a comment uh, from Irene. Um, so Peruvian researcher at UPCH. Um, Irene, it, at this point in time, from what you wrote, it doesn't seem that you're eligible because you do not have a doctorate, unless I'm missing something. Um, I see you having a master's, um, but in order to be eligible, you need to have a PhD or a, doc, a, a professional degree doctoral equivalent in order to be eligible. Let us know if I'm missing something in your what I just read. Other questions? Okay, so Irene responded, and I can see that Anne is a postdoc at UCLA. And I'm not sure what CHIPS is, but. Um, oh, that's Dallas's program. Oh, great. Okay, great. Yeah. And also, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, also, you know, you can continue to, if you have specific questions, you can continue to reach out to us um, individually. Um, and we'll, if we can't answer, or if we're not, don't think we're the best person to answer, we can also connect you with, uh, with others um, at various campuses or partner institutions. Other questions? Kimberly, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, just feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm very happy to answer any questions you have about the application or the fellowship. Some of you have already been in contact with, and others like seeing your name for the first time today. So, always happy to help. Yeah, and do take a look at the successful applications. Um, I think there's a lot of you know, examples of strong applications there. Um, and we also have a checklist of all the required elements for you for it to help guide you as you put together your applications. And again, the deadline is November 15th, and we don't, we have not in seven years extended that deadline. Maybe one year we did, but we're not going to this year. <laughs> so it's November 15th, and you need to have everything in um, on time. The I guess sometimes we don't have the letters from the LMIC. You should have your letters also in by the same deadline. So make sure um, it's required to submit a letter of recommendation from your UC mentor and your international site mentor as part of the application. But actually, those are, should be emailed directly to me from your mentors. So make sure they also get those in by November 15th. Yeah, so that's your responsibility to make sure that they get in on time. Um, So any other questions? Okay, I think we'll wrap up then a few minutes or like 15 minutes early. Um, Lauren, thanks so much. Looks like you have a very colorful office, at least where you're calling in from. Yep, that's a friendly office. Thank you guys so much. It's always nice to see you again. And thank you, Craig, for that uh, course. I don't think I gave you the update that we got that funding. So thanks for yeah, that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, we're going to, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, and um, thanks everyone else for joining. Again, let us know what your questions are uh, between now and the applications are due. And have a good rest of the day.